two, three, four, woo! Welcome to Me and the Geek. I'm Joel Sharpton. I'm me, and every week I talk to a different geek here on the show about their geeky world. You see, it's my opinion that everyone is a geek about something. So week to week, we're going to go and talk to different folks, talk about app design, talk about comic books, talk about movies, talk about music, talk about video games, and everything in between. Lots of stuff that may be surprising to you, lots of stuff that may not be exactly your area of expertise or interest, but hopefully the conversations and the folks that I introduce you to will be interesting in their own right. First of all, I want to say a big thank you to our producers at Team Procreate, Rob and Jeremy. Without them, this show and the rest of the shows on this network wouldn't be possible. So thank you to them. What is this show going to be about? Well, we're going to start with a few pilot episodes. Uh, The first one is what you're listening to right now. We're going to be discussing Spider-Man in the MCU. That's the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Big announcement last week as Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios made a big deal and I brought a few of my best friends in uh, to discuss this. Guys that I knew uh, had uh, their noses in the comic books once upon a time, and now they've got their finger on the pulse of these comic book franchises and what's going on in the movies. So we're going to get straight to it. Hope you enjoy this episode and this discussion. Uh, If not, well, uh, keep looking in the archives there. We've got a couple more for you lined up. And uh, starting very, very soon, you'll get a new episode each week right here at meandthegeekpod.com. I'll be back with you right after the conversation to tell you some ways that you can connect to us. But um, for now, just enjoy me and the geek. Kyle, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Uh, no problem, man. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to make the call. Uh, we've had some technical issues, you and I getting together, but I'm glad that you're being my guinea pig to work this all out. That's why we call these the pilot episodes. It's fun. It's fun to be a part of something new, something that I think is going to really take off. Yeah, I think so. So many fun geek categories to talk about. Absolutely. And the whole reason why I started this podcast in the first place, though, was the announcement of Spider-Man returning to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Sony and Disney getting together, making a big fat corporate agreement, hugging and uh, showing the love, so to speak, as they play nice with one another and share what's probably Marvel's biggest character. So that's what you and I are here to talk about today. We're going to be discussing in future uh, episodes. Uh, They're probably already available. You can uh, check them out with Matthew Bennett and with Jamie Worley. We're going to talk about uh, potential storylines, alternate takes that Marvel could have made, although it looks like now they might have made up their minds uh, for the direction that they're going to take. Right now, though, I want to talk with you, Kyle, about how we got to this place in the first place. Uh, We're going to start with your reactions. When you heard the news... How, what was that like? How did what did you think about it? Um, well, the very first I heard about it, very excited. Even I guess all this kind of came up when Sony had their uh, whole security, everything, emails, everything hacked, and uh, it's been it was some great reading to see sort of some of the inner workings of how Sony was, how dumb people some some people sounded, um, uh, and then the the tease that. Uh, the Marvel uh, Marvel Studios had actually had real life conversations, not just nerd speculation, with Sony about the possibility of using Spider Man. And from there, everything was just such a uh, such a nerdgasm of like, no, it's real. And I think uh, geeks as well as just fans of the comic books and everything have had sort of united and be like, this is actually a really good idea. I mean, I know you guys are talking about it, but we just want to put our little stamp of approval on it. Uh, then I guess flash forward, uh, I mean, you heard some other things like, I guess that the deal was off. Uh, or it's like, oh, well, they didn't end up getting things together to make it in time to have Spider-Man show up in uh, Civil War, which was, I guess, what the Russo brothers had originally wanted. Um, and then, uh, so you thought it was dead or at least you know, not going to happen anytime soon. And then we get, uh, on Monday, a press release comes out, uh, and I was sleeping at the time and my wife actually came and sort of woke me up and was like, I am a bigger geek than you. I found out that Spider-Man has now entered the Marvel Cinematic Universe while you are being lazy. Um, yeah. Why am I, why am I not talking to Julia on this phone call? uh, She is the Supreme geek. Uh, and I mean that with love. Uh, she would say that at me with, love, I guess, as well, but maybe a mixture of hate and envy. 
So now that it's done, we can look back at, at how this actually happened. And it seemed once upon a time, you know, that Sony had the crown jewel of them all, unlike you know, the DC comic universe where all of their characters are under the one corporate banner and have been for quite some time under the Warner Brothers uh, brand. With Marvel for decades, piecemeal, the characters had been sold off to one company or another, different production groups, different studios, different corporations that all wanted a little piece of this superhero game. And some had had more success than others. I think, you know, a lot of people would trace the modern launch of the superhero genre back to perhaps Blade and the original X-Men uh, movie as two great examples of of successful uses of these characters. With Blade, it didn't last and long term. That character has now reverted the rights back to Marvel. There's been other examples, Daredevil, uh, which we're about to finally see on Netflix and we're going to discuss in an upcoming episode of this show. We've got Ghost Rider, which is back now under the banner. The Punisher has returned as well. But nobody ever imagined that Sony would let Spider-Man out of their grasp. And that all started with the Sam Raimi film. Where were you? What, what was your reaction to the, the first uh, movie in that trilogy uh, from Tobey Maguire, Sam Raimi, and company? Uh, I mean, Spider-Man had long been like a favorite comic book hero of mine. So, so Sam Raimi makes the first Spider-Man movie. I'm, I just graduated from high school. Uh, it's great. We're finally kicking off a sort of period of time where visual effects are, are at a certain point that it can carry a, a superhero film. And I think X-Men and Spider-Man are really responsible for bringing the superhero genre into, uh, in, into pop culture. And we have the effects to back up these fantastic uh, examples of mythology. Uh, modern mythology. You make a great point there, though. As as much as fans look back with love and you know a nostalgia for the first couple of X Men films, if you watch those with a critical eye now, they do not hold up as well because of budgets, because of special effects, as compared to the first two Sam Raimi Spider Man movies. I, I feel solidly that that's the definitely. case. definitely. And then I think you know Spider Man, I think is a great movie. But then when Spider-Man 2 came out, it was definitely sort of a step up, uh, a doubling down on sort of character. Spider-Man 2 put him even more through the ringer. Um, I saw it like five times in the theater. Uh, I, I devoted a small religion, I think, to the uh, release <laughs> of Spider-Man 2, its subsequent video game, and uh, then once it came out on DVD. But it was, it was just, it was, yeah, it just moved everything that you loved about Spider-Man, it moved it forward. And it, it sort of intensified it. And you had a great villain with Doc Ock. Definitely, definitely, I think, the highlight from that original trilogy. You know, Kyle, you touched on so many good points there. But it, I, I just want to go ahead and move on because what we really want to talk about is the, the future of this and, and, and how uh, Sony ended up failing. It all starts, though with the transition from Spider-Man 2 to Spider-Man 3. You look at, and, and it's well documented, the the history of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the fact that the whole point was if we put the storytellers in charge, if we put the comics guys in charge of these characters, they will tell the stories that we know have already been successful. That's the idea, at least, at the crux of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Sony went the other direction. Sam Raimi had already made two not only critically successful, but very financially successful movies with the Spider-Man character and in, in, in their universe. And then they started asking for more. Specifically, they pushed for the introduction of the Venom character. Definitely. And uh, Venom is a character that Sam Raimi didn't have any specific love for. Uh, Sam Raimi loved all the classic 60s and 70s villains. Uh, Venom, I guess, probably in the 80s. Uh, maybe even 90s, yeah. But I think, yeah, Sam Raimi didn't really want to wrap his head around that. But Sony kind of forced it with the logic that you have to... Well, Spider-Man 2 was big, but we have to go even bigger. Uh, and uh, it was actually really interesting uh, on uh, the, the Nerdist podcast, uh, Sam Raimi was in for an episode, and uh, it came up very organically, and they started talking about Spider-Man 3. And uh, his thing was like, yeah, I made a lot of mistakes on that. There's a lot of compromise there. Obviously, you have to take in all these people's thoughts and ideas. And um, Sony pushed real hard to have Venom in. He relented. It just got super complicated in there. When you had three villains, you, uh, Venom, Sandman, and uh, Green Goblin too, so uh, it was just tough. It was a tough thing to manage, um, but ultimately that derailed 
the uh, Spider-Man franchise so much so that they didn't continue with the Spider-Man 4 that they were developing. You know, it's not that I'm comparing the two directors specifically, but the way that you explained it, it reminds me of maybe a potential what-if scenario. What if Edgar Wright had continued with Ant-Man, even though he and Marvel were obviously at odds about the direction and the nature of the storyline and the different elements that they wanted to introduce? It, it seems to me that the real best case scenario here would have been a scenario in which Raimi walked away from the franchise and allowed someone else to introduce the Venom character in a more natural way. Yeah. And he said this in the, on the Nerds podcast too. He's just like, I, you know, ultimately it's unfair of me to continue to do something uh, and work with a character that I'm kind of not interested in and give it my half-hearted attention when there are people who are so passionate about that character, let them tell that story. That's and again, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, but he says people still, you know, throw things at him for Spider Man three, <laughs> and um, I, I think there are good elements in there, but it is far outweighed by the sort of clunkiness. So Sony was not in a completely original situation here. They've they've got a movie franchise that stalled, that sort of critically and commercially reviled in comparison to its predecessors, anyway. And now, what do they do? Warner Brothers faced the exact same issue after the third and fourth Batman films uh, in their original series. And what did they do? They put Batman in a box. The difference, of course, Sony couldn't sit on him because he wasn't theirs to sit on. They, it's, a, it's a use or lose situation. So they had to move forward with another plan. And that's when they bring in Mark Webb, hot off of, of course, the movie that I think of when I think of Spider-Man. Um, 500 Days of Summer, right? A classic superhero action thriller. If I've uh, ever wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't that movie an out of a uh, linear uh, succession romance story, I think? Yeah, that's what that's about. Yeah. Joseph Gordon-Levitt is in Here's it. Here's the other thing, though. If you're going to get Mark Webb, and this is what I wondered at the time, why not also get Joseph Gordon-Levitt? At the time, he had just turned 30 or something like that. And so they, of course, went with the 27-year-old Andrew Garfield. Yeah, yeah, that's so much younger. Uh, so so you, you have Andrew Garfield, though, and I've made this argument uh, before on and off uh, different podcasts and the Internet in general. I like Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man. I do not care for his Peter Parker. He is a pretty boy. He is a rock star in some ways, and, and Peter Parker is not that. I love his, his Spider-Man. I think he's, he's got the one-liners. He's... Uh, he's funny. He's really enjoying himself out there. But then when you switch over to the Peter Parker, he's kind of this emo, antisocial, skateboarding dude. And I get that they're trying to modernize the take on Peter Parker <laughs> a little bit to make him not necessarily nerd. Obviously, uh, ladies are going to buy him more as a romantic lead if he's kind of cool and a little bit tortured uh, teenager versus the uh, I like science and uh, other things. You know, the, the interesting thing to me is that new potential trilogy, it ended up only being a duology, I guess, from uh, Sony. They kept a heavy focus on the Osbournes as the uh, sort of central antagonists or the reason for everything that is wrong in New York and Spider-Man's life specifically. Right. Well, again, like that's one of the things about the amazing Spider-Man sort of franchise is that it feels kind of small. All the evil in the world comes from a company called Oscorp. All the bad guys were obviously growing out from there. And then once we see an amazing Spider-Man two, there's uh yeah, there's just a floor with all these sort of military weapon grade wings and octopus arms and <laughs> a rhino mech suit. That is like the idea that all of this came together or would come together to be all of, Spider-Man's big villains uh, just felt like sort of a, uh, I don't know, a misstep. If your eventual goal is to get to Venom, I just feel like they did a whole lot of tread and water if they wanted to get to the character that that means spinoffs, um, right? And if, I know what they were obviously trying to do is to build quickly this, this new mega franchise where uh, you'd have spinoffs with the Sinister Six, Black Cat, um potentially even the Aunt May spy film. I don't know. And then, of course, they're, the, the big one they were hoping for is, I guess, uh, doing Venom right uh, and giving him his own movie. Uh, but it all seemed to just kind of... It was pushing too much too fast there for 
one movie. You know, it's one of the most interesting things I think about the idea of bringing him into the MCU is that with the continued expansion of the cosmic side of things, there are obvious, easy, explainable ways to bring in the symbiote uh, idea, to bring in the Venom character specifically, to allow it to grow organically, uh, pardon the pun, um, both within the Spider-Man franchise and then as a thing unto itself, because that is a character and an idea that's very worth mining over time, but you can't shortchange it. And I think that's one of the great things that the MCU has done. Think about the long-term nature of the Bucky character, for instance, his moments in the first Captain America movie are few. He's never mentioned really or referenced in the Avengers movie and yet comes back to play this gigantic part in Captain America 2. And you know he will play a large part in the continuing expansion of that universe. Now we are presented with finally a natural opportunity to get to the Venom storyline. And will the two companies have the patience to get there in the right way? Now, patience is definitely, I think, the key word. Marvel had, even at the at the beginning, it's not like we're doing a Captain America movie. We have to put every Captain America villain in there. We have to do, like, they, they were able to just do something nice, like a nice retro action adventure. Because um, they had the confidence that I think they knew there was an audience that was going to still be there and that they didn't have to, uh, they didn't have to, jam everything in and they could just tell a nice organic story. Um, and now with Spider-Man, yes, I think there are just, there's so many easier ways to as organic as a black goo space alien symbiote is ever going to be to explain. It's never been easier now that you have kind of the weird cosmic side developed with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Guardians of the Galaxy and Thanos. Yeah, not just developed, but like wholeheartedly embraced. I Every, you know, normal people, not geeks, but normal people are wearing a talking raccoon and a walking tree around on T-shirts and carrying them as figurines and putting them on their desk and things like this. Like this is this is the outside edge of the Marvel Universe in many ways. And it's now been set at the center of at least the cosmic side of it. I think the I think the goals of Marvel should get bigger and grander and broader, and they should be pushing the envelope on what has been the conventional wisdom that "quote unquote" mainstream audiences can follow and be entertained by. But I don't, yeah, on that, I had a question for you. Like, what do you think Marvel gets out of this deal to have Spider Man back? I know Marvel as a company still has the merchandising rights for Spider Man, so any success is going to benefit them in that way. That I think that's the primary thing. For, first of all, they get to stop the potential dilution of their brand or the loss of the Spider-Man character as a tool in other medium. On the surface, you're right. It may just be that Disney paid the money uh, back in 2011, I believe, um, and and or Marvel did, bought the um, all of the merchandising rights back from Sony for the Spider-Man character. But I also think it works the other way. The X-Men are not being controlled in the mainstream audience's minds. They don't, they don't want, they don't like that image. They don't like the representation in a lot of cases, I think. They don't like the way that that character is presented or marked now in the public's mind. And they don't feel like they can combat it just with comics, just with toys. They didn't want that to happen to Spider-Man, I think. But I think the real benefit is that they continue to be able to use and control the destiny. And I know that's a weird word to talk about when you're discussing a fictional being, but it, the destiny of Spider-Man, uh, they're in charge of that now as far as the public is concerned. And I think that's the most important aspect of it. I think that they want all of their characters under the same banner, and I think they want all of their toys on the same shelf. That may not be possible in the short or even long term as far as actually owning the rights. The X-Men franchise is unlikely to be available in that way. The Fantastic Four franchise is unlikely to be available in that way. But this deal, I think, holds the template for other similar deals to be discussed. And, and that's where I want to go right now is what exactly is this deal? Here's what we know about it for sure, right, Kyle? Mm -hmm. We know that uh, Spider-Man will appear in at least one Marvel movie, one MCU film, before the solo film uh, that is co-produced by Sony and Disney that will be released in May, uh, excuse me, July of 2017. So we're going to get a solo Spider-Man film, at least one, co-produced by Amy Pascal, former CEO of um, 
Sony Pictures and by Kevin Feige, the head of Marvel Studios. We're going to get at least one MCU appearance by Spider-Man. Well, I, one of the things that was super interesting about looking at that, the press release and then all the uh, articles and bloggers talking about their interpretations of it was the was the thing that Sony has, quote unquote, final approval. Like, obviously, they they've sort of failed enough with the Amazing Spider-Man franchise that now, rather than go forth on that reboot franchise, they're they're looking for the confidence that Marvel Studios and the goodwill that that's going to bring towards their next uh, their next Spider-Man venture. When they say that they have final approval, it, it really looks to me like all that success is going to Marvel Studios, uh, especially with Kevin Feige at the helm. Any of the failure, I think, easily is going to be attributed to Sony or Amy Pascal or uh, of them, you know, messing with the Marvel formula of, of blockbuster success. Sony has the ability to sort of revive this character uh, by essentially going to the experts and with no money changing hands, uh, it, it seems clear that Sony just wants to put out a good movie to, to make money, sure, but then potentially also to to continue the spinoff plan that they had originally. And that's the part that I get a little uh, a little worried about. This is why, Kyle, that I'm not terribly worried about the potential spinoffs. I think that Kevin Feige and Marvel Studios. Has being it has done a great uh, thing here by being vague in the continued and further potential uh, benefits for both sides based on this agreement right now. Kevin Feige doesn't like the way that the Sinister Six movie is coming together, or thinks you need to wait on the Sinister Six movie, let's say, and and make it after the solo Spider-Man film so that you can sow the seeds. Hey, I've got a great pitch for that. Let me tell you how we set it up in the Spider-Man movie, and then you do the Sinister Six next. And I think that Sony might not want to follow those directions, but he can always say, well, look, you can do it the way that you want to, but without these sorts of directions, it's not going to fit into the broader MCU, and so I'm not going to be able to loan you Bruce Banner and Agent Coulson like I was planning on. Do you not want them in the movie? Right. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, hopefully there's a there's a way that they can kind of, uh, the, I guess, a patient plan that they can sort of follow to let things happen more organically then we got to put out four movies this year <laughs> the the other thing that that they can do to sort of guide sony in this way is if it's true that they not only have access to spider-man but you know the the other spider-man world characters and you and i have talked about this offline before you got to bring in jk simmons for instance you, you, you or excuse me you got to bring in j jonah jameson you got to bring in jk simmons as j jonah jameson that's absolutely true there's no other person you should cast in that role but you got to bring him in now i mean look aka jessica jones is filming for netflix as we speak luke cage is filming after that daredevil's already in the can but you got the iron fist series down the road you've got agents of shield next year find time to put him even if it's if it's tv interviews where he's just in the background of the scene as you walk in to a room and he's ranting about vigilantes and and these quote unquote superheroes that's sowing the seeds of the broader world you've got all of these active projects use those active projects to mold the universe that sony will be handed when they are allowed to do their own projects and then you've sort of hemmed them in into a positive direction that would be my idea i don't know i like the idea that maybe marvel studios and sony would be uh, in bed together and sort of really willing to like to really just tell the right story. I, ha I have no problem seeing any of those potential planned Spider-Man spinoffs as long as it's handled with the same confidence and patience that you have in a Marvel Studios movie. The one thing, the one thing that's kind of coming up for me a little bit now is I know a lot of people are upset that Black Panther and Captain Marvel, these two movies. That are featuring the kind of now the first diverse heroes that were getting that are getting their own films, a, a black superhero and a, a woman superhero who's in the forefront, uh, have now been pushed back another season, uh, just because well Spider Man, but is is having him back in the in the universe potentially going to you know put some of the other things that Marvel had planned uh, kind of push it to be less of a priority especially knowing that Civil War still has the possibility of including Spider-Man maybe sort of in where Black Panther was sort of the placeholder to be used when they didn't have the rights for Spidey. I, I like the question, and I was actually just about to lead you in this exact same direction. I, here, here's, here's my thought. I am very upset 
especially the two you mentioned. Yes, I am. I am upset that we have to wait an, another. It's not a year for any of these movies. It's just several months in each case. But we have to wait several more months for Black Panther. We have to wait several more months for Captain Marvel. I think Marvel is definitely going to have to play loose on their feet. And I think there is the potential for the slip up. Here's the thing, though. We have not even begun the crank up of the DC cinematic universe, but soon we'll get two and eventually maybe three DC movies a year. We are going to, I imagine for the next five or six years, at least get at least three Marvel movies a year. One of those, it seems now every two or three years will be a Spider-Man movie co-produced with Sony. But even if Sony were to eventually up their output, I don't think that's going to the the sideline films in the potential Spider-Man universe. If they do spinoffs that don't feature Spider-Man or feature very little of him, I don't think those are going to hinder the MCU plans. I don't think they're going to slow the Marvel Cinematic Universe or slow uh, Disney and, and Marvel Studios down. So I'm not worried about it long term. I it does make me a little sore. For the short term, though, there's no doubt about it. Not, not, not that it's not worth the trouble. It's definitely worth the trouble uh, of spending that time and, and making quality Spider-Man films. And even if we are dropping down uh, one superhero uh, movie a year overall, between instead of having Sony do their separate things and cranking them out, and Marvel doing their own things, cranking them out, and DC doing their own things, losing one film a year is not, not that bad, <laughs> especially when we know it's going to be quality. Absolutely, absolutely. Reducing the quantity a little bit for more quality is fine by me. The other thing, I, I do think you're going to see, and you're already seeing it, but I think you're going to see television production ramp up. I would not be surprised if eventually Marvel doesn't have, you know, 10 different TV shows on every single season. And it can be a fun way to sort of do something specific that MCU uh, model of like, okay, we're doing a political thriller here. We're doing a uh, a kung fu TV show here, like there's so much breath with just the approach to these characters that that we get to play in so many different subgenres within the big superhero genre, which is just great, and it allows itself for so much reinvention. Every every character can be a different type. It's so great. The the other thing is, if you look at the budgets here, the rumors are anyway that you've got the the uh, Daredevil series roughly at about three million dollars an episode. Not every episode costs three million, but that's the average for that series, a thirteen episode series. So you're talking about that same sort of ballpark, a $35, $45 million movie, except you're getting 13 hours of content, which you're going to be able to repurpose and resell in dozens of ways over the course of time. You're also allowing to fully explore and build out not only Daredevil, but all of the, the other characters that inhabit and color his world. While you're doing that, you're broadening the exposure and the general knowledge of all of these characters. If any of them hit, if any of these are super successful and take the mainstream by storm, you know they'll be promoted to movie status. So Marvel gets to do two things at once. They get to manage these gigantic franchises which already have mainstream appeal and understanding and acceptance and... and um, and a cast. Yes, and, and, and the gigantic cast, exactly. And, and at the same time, they get to build the smaller world and sort of farm out their second generation of films. But to me, the Marvel Studios story, the, the first generation of that really goes all the way up to 2019 with the end of the Infinity War uh, Part 2. And at that point, I think you're going to be looking at what the second generation of it is. Their universe is building and growing over time. And you are finding new characters that can fit those archetypes that you already have developed a history and affinity for. I think that is really the beauty of what this experiment with Marvel Studios and Disney has proven. I think that's what it is. It's it's the long-term love of characters. It's what TV has been doing for 25, 30 years. Totally. And it's just in a much larger, bigger budget, bigger spectacle. We are living in such a wonderful nerd time. Excellent thoughts. Excellent thoughts. Excellent conversation. What an amazing time to be a geek. Am I right? I couldn't agree more. To have Spider-Man back in, into the fold with the MCU and Kevin Feige uh, at the helm of this, it makes me super excited. It's happening, and it's 
it really is sort of a, a geek stream come true. I'm going to talk to you soon. Uh, we'll talk next time about Star Trek. Tell everybody where they can find you online, Kyle. Uh, you can find me pretty much anywhere. Uh, I got Twitter and Vine at Kyle is funny. Um, and if you guys are in the Austin area, please check me out. I perform weekly at Cold Town Theater in a group called Movie Riot, where we perform improvised movies right on the spot. It's a lot more fun than it sounds when I say, uh, come see my improv show. I promise. <laughs> Of course it is. Of course it is. That's what everybody says. Uh, no, but really it is. I promise. All right, Kyle, thank you so much for joining me. What a great conversation with Kyle Sweeney. Uh, don't forget to check him out on Twitter and Vine at Kyle is funny. Uh, we're going to have him back on soon. Uh, we, we mentioned Star Trek and we are going to have a Star Trek episode, but actually the next episode with him will be a, a discussion about Saturday Night Live's 40th anniversary and the show overall. We're going to talk about that coming up soon here on me and the geek pod.com. Find us on Twitter at me and the geek on Facebook too at me and the geek. You can also email us me and the geek at team com. That's just some ways that you can feed back to us. Let us know what you think of the show. Let us know uh, topics that you'd like to hear us discuss in the future, but I'm going to give you a sneak peek real quick. As I said, we're going to start this show with these pilot episodes discussing Spider-Man and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but we're going to go in a whole different left field pretty quickly. We're going to talk about Saturday Night Live, as I mentioned, and their 40th anniversary. We're going to talk about geeky preachers and ways to bring social media and multimedia into the pulpit. We're going to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, boy, there's an, uh, two different subjects. If you're a kid like me that grew up in the 90s, Dungeons and Dragons and Preachers, uh, who would ever think that those things would be together? But we're going to talk with a buddy of mine about uh, Dungeons Dungeons and Dragons, and specifically the new 5th edition set, and why you might be interested, even if you've never role-played before. All of that and more coming your way soon, right here at Me and the Geek. Until next time, I'm me, that's Joel Sharpton. You can find me on Twitter at The Rogue's Life. This week's geek was Kyle Sweeney, and this has been the podcast. One, two, three, four, woo! Me and the Geek is a proud member of the ProCast Network, a ProCreate production. ProCreate is a community of artists in film, music, the digital arts, and fine arts that helps them connect and collaborate on projects. You can find out more at teamprocreate.com. Also, be sure to check out one of our other great shows like Pod on Pod, a weekly review of a different podcast to help you find your new favorite show. Josh and Joel are your hosts as they walk through the wide world of podcasting. From comedy to self-help, Josh and Joel listen to it all so you don't have to.